Welcome to today's episode of The Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch. What is the core benefit of listening to this show? Business leaders in corporate and privately held companies gain insights into trends and strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Each episode focuses on areas such as marketing, sales, innovation, or funding that is absolutely critical to the growth of companies, whether they are startups or corporate global players. Where management needs to juggle the challenges of market entries or knowing how to navigate the uncertainty of disruptive developments, mind feeding is where clarity evolves and helps solving organizational challenges. For those who listen to the entire episode, I have a special surprise gift. I'm also working on some great guests that are industry leaders in management, innovation, and marketing. And we will be talking in the future much more about the important trends that are affecting the way we manage our companies in the demand to being sustainable, more environmentally and socially friendly, and becoming more empathic leaders. So let's get started on today's topic. So in today's episode, we'll be talking about Trust is an important part of driving sustainability in an organization. We will be looking at two different key questions, which are how can we build that trust in an organizational culture that delivers real results for all the stakeholders? And is there a proven trust model that can spark action in people in and outside of an organization. With me today, I've got uh, Jim, and he is a Chief Sustainability Officer at uh, Zai Labs, where he drives the design of the global biopharmaceutical company sustainability vision and strategy. Now, before I go deeper in all these things and we get started on our topic, Jim, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes. Hi, Christian. It's great to be talking with you today. I love the topic of trust, and I believe it's foundational to everything we do, including how we believe in ourselves. So um, I think the best way to start off describing who I am is to talk about, I, I, I genuinely believe I was born to build. Um, I love creating new. I love um, helping others do the same. And so I wake up every day trying to figure out how to take the systems that are around us and make them better and inspire others to do the same. You know, I, I always say I'm, I'm looking to find co-conspirators in good, both for permanence and impact. And I think that's the best way to describe who I am. Um, I will say I live in the United States. I'm outside Washington, D.C. I'm partnered. My wife, Emily, and I are raising Sawyer and Lawson, they're 16 and 14. We love mm -hmm. adventure and seeking it wherever we can. And it often includes us hitting the road to find that adventure through travel. Yeah, that's great because you see as well a lot of uh, the countryside. I mean, think of it, the U.S. has a lot to offer. Um, even if you just stay inside the U.S., there's so much to see just from uh Everywhere from Yellowstone to every kind of different places. You yeah. know, Christian, it's it's funny you bring that up because um, we actually took our boys to all 50 states in three and a half years on school breaks. And yeah. again, it, it comes back to I had this silly idea that um, I said out loud one day and they're like, no, we could never do that. But then, you know, <laughs> you, you were talking about is there a trust model there is a trust model. We'll get to it. But I had to use it to convince my family we could accomplish an audacious goal to, you know, what we ended up doing was going to each state line. There's a sign that says, welcome to blank state. And yeah. we took selfies and we have 50 <laughs> of those because I was, I was brave enough to trust myself. And so you're exactly right. Get out into nature, see it. It's what we're all fighting to save. 
And uh, I actually used the trust model to help convince my family that we could do what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah, that's that's true. Because as well, when I was a kid, uh, I lived in South America and always through the holidays. And in South America, the holidays were a bit longer than Europe. Uh, and we didn't have all these other holidays that in Europe usually is so full of. And uh, that gave us an advantage to travel sometimes from the east to the west coast or from north to south or from Canada Wonderful. down to USA and so on. So as a kid, I saw lots of stuff. Uh, lots of places and, and things like we always always remember always um, think of uh, Dennis you know the place where you can have breakfast and all, oh, yes, all those yes. things <laughs> yeah those things of course those are memories of the 80s uh, my daughter of course her last <laughs> recent memories of the US is, is IHOPs which yes. is totally different <laughs> not that's to this fantastic. kind of food that's really <laughs> this, funny that's funny when you think of all different things, and, and we, we uh, as we age, of course, the countries, the nations, everything changes, the habits, technology, and so on. Like in my time when I was a kid, uh, it all was more or less somehow planned. There was a basic idea, and you traveled from one place to another and found a motel to stay. You, yes. Now you go on, on some app, book your stuff, um, and if there's somewhere in between, book a flight, take a bolt, an Uber, whatever. It's easy. But then it was... Uh, planning and a lot of adventure and not knowing where you ended up. But you knew Absolutely. at a certain time you had to be at the one city to take the plane back home. <laughs> so, yes. it is, the, the world is rapidly changing, right? And um, exactly. even in our lifetime, like you'll appreciate, you, since you traveled as a kid, going map to map, at least in the United States, there'd be like M6 and you'd have to find where M6 met on page 187 to see where the road continued. And now we, we just use Waze or MapQuest or Google Maps and just go yep. as long and as far as we need to. So all of exactly. these things are, in my mind, Christian, the, the, what's challenging in today um, for so many of us is, you know, we, mm. we remember how easy or maybe we forget how easy it was to get lost. And now I can't get lost as long as I have my app. So we talk about change as if it's negative. But it it's actually has simplified our lives and, and can be helping us make better, faster decisions, in particular when it comes to sustainability, I think. Exactly. And that's the thing. Sometimes uh, we can even get lost when our smart devices don't work. Like once I was on a business trip and I had to take a, a, from the airport a bus and then had to change to another bus and walk a certain path to get to the hotel. And what happened in the early, early morning, my phone died. It didn't uh -huh. work. And so I had to do all the trip. Luckily enough, I had printed out my flight tickets and everything. I didn't couldn't use the app, of course. And eventually, I got out in the city, and I didn't know exactly where to go. I asked several people, and then I thought, okay, gut feeling, you have to go this and this way. Eventually, it was the right way. Got it there. And the next morning, my phone suddenly revived. It uh -huh. arose from the dead again. Uh, but all that time, it was awkward because you were offline, you couldn't do anything. Uh, you couldn't even take photos, other kind of stuff of the event, which was so good. Um, but that was it. And when you think of it, yeah, we then have to trust in our gut feeling because yes. our smartphone is dead. And That's it's not right. going to tell us anything. That's yes, absolutely. It's and, and again, it's another example. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to jump into the model yet, but I, I will come back to talking about yeah. the example when, when your phone died, right? It's absolutely mm -hmm. the, the legitimacy of, of trust. Exactly. And, and that's the thing when you look at, at culture as well. We always uh, have, especially with organiza organizations, it's always a strange feeling culture. And you think, mm, what's this supposed to be? You can, of course, write down a culture, but are you really living it? Is it really that way? That's not so easy. No, it is not. And I think that um, culture is a fascinating piece. And so, again, you know, we, we can go anywhere you want, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, I think it's probably going to be easier, Christian, if I, you know, if you don't mind, I'll go and jump into the model I use. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because in particular, you talk about culture. And so, you know, I think another thing I probably left out of my introduction is I'm a practitioner, so I don't sit in academia researching, right? I'm yeah. at the front line of business. I have been where decisions are being made on key strategy for multinational organizations on how will we become a sustainable company? And so throughout my career, 
Um, you know, my graduate work was in organization development. I focused on individual accountability. It's kind of where my passion lies. And so it won't be surprising to hear if I talk about individual accountability, trust is going to come into play. And so what, what I do as a practitioner is I've, I've used a lot of different management theory. Um, you know, Financial Times recently came out criticizing how little management theory gets into play because it's hard to take something that was created in the abstract and apply it real time. And so I realized there was a uh-huh. gap. So I, as a practitioner, would, you know, take bits and pieces and I've developed a model that I, I call my, my trust model that has three primary foundations. And I sum it up as can, care, do. Mm-hmm. the elements of trust can is are you capable and the reason i want to dive into this is because the first area of can really boils down to why do you exist as a person or an organization what is your purpose mm-hmm. and what are your values and how do those values drive culture and so i think that that is foundational to trust is you know can you accomplish what it is you were created to do and, and it's, mm-hmm. it's a very soul-searching question for an individual or for an organization. And then, you know, you move from can, once you can do something, the next element of trust is, do you care? And this is where we are always evaluating one another. In your, in your example of culture within a company, employees want to make sure that their employers care. And do they have my best interest at heart? And then the final aspect, I think it's really important of culture and organizations is the, I do, I take action. And so are you walking your walk? So the model of can care do is, you know, an organization can be asking itself quickly. If, if something's not working, I believe foundational to things not working well is a lack of trust. People aren't able to bring their whole selves or commit to. And so that's where I want to introduce the model and focus a little bit on the the first aspect of can is does the organization understand what it's about, what its purpose is. And it's not the purpose of the business internally, but the purpose of business in society. What's the impact they're bringing? And that's why I'm so passionate about the sustainability agenda. Exactly. Because uh, when you think of we read now so much about ESG and all the taxonomy and, and people are trying to um, either say it in a negative way, negative narrative, positive narrative, or people are trying to explain, hey, we need to pick the good things out and use them instead of misusing the whole thing to do like greenwashing and other kind of uh, silly stuff because eventually the people who are doing that will be found out and that's not exactly very good for people's brand and even trust. And when you think of it, if somebody is doing this kind of greenwashing, you don't actually want to work in that company because obviously the culture is supporting the bad side of certain things instead of actually the positive stuff. Because what does a human being want to do usually, and besides, of course, surviving, um, having some kind of purpose in life? Yes. Let's say a, a kind of a positive impact whether it's bringing up our kids, whether it's, it's helping other people who have made me not so lucky in certain things or or seeing certain things and thinking, hey, uh, this can't be that uh, this and this is so broken, this is not good, we need to find a solution, fix it and so on. And I think that's the key thing, as you say, trust, of course, uh, must be as well validated because otherwise you can say things, you can write down stuff, but if you don't actually do it, stand by it, then it's just a, piece of paper sticking on the wall and nobody yeah. will look at it anymore. You know, I, I was with a group of other chief <laughs> sustainability officers yesterday mm-hmm. um, having a conversation on this whole concept of green, insert word after, green washing, green hushing, yeah. green, you know, <laughs> there's this new taxonomy of green something and it's predominantly negative behavior. And I, I said, you know, one of the things I try to do is help individuals and organizations. When I talk about why do you exist, none of us exist to make money. That is a built system. You know, the financial industry is one built to work to make people with money get more money. And we're seeing it work really well right now. The transition of wealth from, you know, the average middle class to the extremely wealthy is the most significant that's ever been in history. 
And we see a trajectory continue to go that way. So I, what I try to get, and I think, you know, when we talk mm-hmm. about greenwashing, what I fundamentally believe is happening is companies are not focused on their, the role of that organization in society. And so you may have a company like healthcare saying, oh, but look what we're doing on environment. Yet mm-hmm. what everyone, the reason that organization exists is not to help the environment. It's to address the other sustainable development goal of health and well-being. And so what are you doing in that space? Are you creating the next innovation in medicine? Are you making it accessible and affordable? Or are you only putting it in wealthy countries so you can make money? And that to me is the the worst case of greenwashing. When companies applaud these activities and efforts, yet they're not addressing the core impact negative or positive they're having on society because of why they created the business in the first place. Exactly. That's why ESG is not just about environment. It's about the society and about the way we govern ourselves and our different kind of things we do, which is actually quite an interesting thing when when we think of it, as you say. It's, it's, like, it's like as if you're setting up a tent on a beach and you're constantly letting the sand uh, be pulled away by the water Eventually, you'll have sand in your tent, but uh, you can't say, hey, I put up a, a tent and now people can sleep in it. Uh, well, it makes no sense if everybody gets wet in the tent. Right, right. <laughs> it has to be a bit done sensibly uh, that we're as well not trashing our environment with that, with what we're doing. Um, yeah, because we, we, whatever we produce as a product, we are producing as well some kind of output as a product and as well as a side product. Yeah. And as well, garbage as well. We have to dispose of the stuff that we don't use, even if it's just packaging or anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I think um, I am glad environment is front and center. Um, and, you know, one of the things I am trying to emphasize is as a global startup company, mm-hmm. yes, we need to be mind our P's and Q's is a, a phrase that is used here in the mm-hmm. States quite frequently. But, you know, we, we need to do what's right with our greenhouse gas emissions. But when it comes to environment, we are working on antibiotics and infectious mm-hmm. disease, which is m- more focused around biodiversity and antimicrobial resistance, AMR. And Mm. so as a company, our bigger potential environmental impact, both positive and negative, is in that space. And much less, you know, we don't extract from the earth. We aren't coal and oil. We aren't Mm. agriculture. We aren't distribution. You know, those are the big contributors to greenhouse gas. There was an estimate once that there's about 100 major corporations that if we got them focused, we could be addressing climate heating, global heating and climate change. Um, you know, and so that's where I, I want companies to come back. And, and there are so many other areas where we could be, we need to be working in systems and changing those systems that if, if we allow people to focus, I think we will be able to address more and, and then get away from companies being applauded for being sustainable when in actuality they're addressing the low hanging, easy things to get and not the core business purpose. Exactly, because that's the thing. When you look at uh, different oil companies, they can have an uh, ESG rating, which is very nice. And then when you look at somebody who's actually doing uh, groundbreaking stuff in environmental things, you think, uh, how come that company has uh, the same rating? It makes no right. sense. It's, uh, it, it's just uh, cheating. It is. And uh, in the end, it damages the whole positive idea of what's actually behind ESG. And then eventually... Whether it's politicians, scientists, or whoever created this taxonomy in the end, the idea then just backfired because people just found a way to cheat again. Yes. It doesn't help the environment, nor our communities, nor even our own business ideas or cause or markets. And Mm. it fundamentally forces all of us to lose trust in those systems because people aren't doing what they say they will do. Mm. Exactly. And and that's the thing. It leaves people then distrustful of the whole system, the whole efforts, what companies are doing, what companies are saying and so on. And because some then say something that they're not actually, uh, let's say, signing on actively, 
um, they then eventually start be thinking, well, then others must as well be not being truthful, which is not yeah. good because uh, if, let's say, you have a room and you have four people who are doing honest stuff and others are cheating, then eventually, of course, everybody will say, well, then everybody must be cheating the exam or yeah. test or whatever <laughs> they're cheating on. Mm. And, and Christian, I think that's one of the important things. So when I introduce my model of can, care, do, it's also important mm -hmm. to know that trust exists at self. Do I trust myself? Uh -huh. It exists in my team, whether it is my direct team like or function within a company. But then it also, trust exists at that larger level of system, as you're saying. And I think one of the things that motivated me to write my book, Trust in Action, The Leader's Guide to Act Right Now, mm. is that I kept hearing um, from other leaders, other executives that, you know, I know we're losing trust in our systems. And eventually that starts to weigh down. If I can't trust the system, how do I trust myself? And I realized we just kept throwing this word trust around. So I wanted to dimensionalize it for people, define it give them a quick can care do is is very easy to remember the book is easy mm -hmm. you know it's 150 pages it's part <laughs> memoir part business case but focused on the model because anytime you're going through if you don't trust a system it's going to be hard to believe that you can change that system yet foundationally i know that the only way the systems begin to change is when we change ourselves and so my mantra is we must transform ourselves to trust ourselves, to transform the teams or those closest to us to transform the world or the system around us. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that's that's true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's why I, I, I say my book is part memoir, right? <laughs> because there have been many times I've been told, OK, Jim, we're giving you this function now, lead it. And I, I, I'm a classically trained consumer marketer, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I understand influencing human behavior. And now as a leader, I understand the importance of doing it consistent with a vision, consistent with, you know, I always say changing human behavior for good, both permanence and impact, <laughs> right? So it's one thing yeah. to change human behavior. And we've talked a lot about how organizations can have bad behavior. My yeah. mission is to build behavior that is for good. And, and I think that's the important part. And it can be easy to question myself. A, you know, the, I call it imposter syndrome. Many people don't believe in it, but I do. I think all of us sometimes sit there and think, who am I? And that starts to erode self-trust. The moment I start asking, who am I? I'm not confident that I can. And then I always have to remind myself, I didn't get where I am to not believe that I'm capable of learning and taking on a topic and changing. So, um, you know, trust is so intertwined in so many of our daily activities, we sometimes forget it, but it's why I wanted to help create this model of can, care, do, because when I start questioning myself, it's in the, the foundation of can. And so then I need to go back there and start exploring quickly. You know, these are, it's like ladder of inference. It's stuff that just quickly starts running through your head. This isn't a three-day process. It's, wait a minute, I am capable. Get over it, get in there, ask tough questions, keep moving forward, engage others so they know you're in it with them. But most importantly, be consistent and do what you say you will. And then it, it, it allows me to get the trust to start taking action. Exactly. And that attracts us for new people because companies that don't do this, the people are going. They're looking for purpose, for real truth and real commitment. And when they see that a certain company is doing that, what you are telling us about, then uh, they see there is it's the right place for them to be. Yes. Not somewhere where they are wasting life and say, okay, I, I've got a salary, but honestly, uh, one is maybe... Uh, I wouldn't say exactly discouraged, but one is maybe embarrassed to a certain degree or disgraced inside one's own trust of thinking, do I actually know for whom I should be working? Yes. It actually contributes positively to a community, to environment, to all the different things that are important in the deepest manner of our meaning. Yeah, 100%. It's, mm. it's one of the things I love about my organization, um, you know, Xi Laboratories. When, when I was brought in, I, I was talking about, you know, I had worked previously at AstraZeneca, an organization with more than a century of history. Mm. Yeah. And, 
And so there were things that, you know, a hundred years ago, we thought were the right decisions only to learn 20 years later, oh man, we should have done it differently, right? And, and so one of the important things for me, Christian, is when I talk about new organizations, we don't get to start out as though, you know, we have no history. And so it doesn't mean we get to start out like other companies did a hundred years ago. So for me, one of the things that was really important, and luckily the executive team supports this, is as we start adding new employees, I want to be very intentional. One of the topics that I'm very passionate about is equity, and in particularly gender equity. You know, um, mm-hmm. those who identify as male and female is the simplest way to talk about this. Um, mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that as the, this organization was growing, we weren't going to talk about by 2030 we want to have pay equity. What if we built it right from the start? And so organizations that are starting out today need to be thinking about this. And so when it comes to equity, as we started adding employees, we had wonderful recruiters and team members. And so we have in our first 18 months that I've been with the organization, we've established equity and leadership and pay at all levels. And so our target now is to maintain that. And I think exactly. that's one of the, the big differences is you you do it by learning from others. And so, you know, as all these other legacy companies are trying to get to equity, we created it. We have 2000 employees. And the other thing I love, Christian, is it's not just in HR or corporate affairs that we have this. We look at the data based on the core aspect of business. So we have pay equity in STEM positions. We have leadership equity in STEM positions. We have both the equity in our Profit and loss, it's often referred to as PL roles. And that's mm-hmm. unheard of. Most companies will say they have it, but not in the core aspect of the business for which it's operating. And exactly. That's and that's the that's the thing when you think of it, there is actually no reason for this kind of uh, inequality. Because if a person is doing the same thing, it doesn't matter what gender they have. It's the same job, it's the same task. And and the, the crazy thing is, this apparently is even existing in many companies, even in sales. When you think of it, yes. the same person with different gender generating the same level of profit, but gets disadvantaged to a level where you think, well, actually, it's still quite a miracle and maybe some gender issue that not enough women decide to go and start their own business because so many of them are actually talented to do all these different things, but are accepting this inequality, yes. which is actually insane when you think of it. And even in today's time, it's not like as if we're living in the 18th century. It's past this stuff. We are well, in a and, different time. And, and Christian, for me to trust myself, right? I want to be walking mm-hmm. my walk. I want to be paid fairly. Yeah. So what I always love to say with this data is when I show it, it's like, you know, listen, the organization has proven to me that I'm paid fairly. It mm-hmm. isn't about women being paid fairly. It's about me. You know, I, I identify as male and, and it's like, listen, the data shows I'm being paid fairly. And, and that to me is the important part, right? And then it happens to be gender equity. So yeah, women, you know, if you want to come work at Xi Laboratories, you will be paid the same as your male colleagues, right? That's the sad yeah. narrative of today's state. But also, I feel like your point, this is in the 1800s. So that's why I try to talk about it in a non-gender conversation. Listen, my company demonstrates me I'm paid fairly. That's what I want to see in a company. Because yeah. often it is so mysterious and not spoken about. Exactly. And, and we always uh, often see it as a gender thing, but that even exists in, in ethnical differences and so on between yes. people, where you then actually, when you're working with, with a team of people who are from different countries, different genders and so on, total mix and different upgrowing and different education background and so on, you can actually see there's so much potential there. But if you waste it with the wrong focus on the wrong things, well, you're just burning your full potential to be highly successful. And, and it's how, how, when was the company found? Because 2,000 employees is a fantastic number. As yes, a yes. So, so we were founded in um, 2014 and went global. And um, we started developing our, our global strategy in 2018. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So it's a it, great it, number for that. For that, uh, you think of many many companies at that age and that special area. It's not as if you're doing some online games and other kind of stuff. It's quite complex topic. Well, and, 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 it's and a lot of responsibility with, as well with it. That's it. And Christian, that that's the thing I think so important, right? Is we are highly specialized in biotech. So, mm -hmm. you know, our average employees have advanced degrees. Exactly. And and we have gender equity. Yeah, and they're not so easy to come by. You have no. to find them first. And and those who you can't find, you have to make them find you. They yeah. say, I want to work for that company. Yeah. I want to leave whatever wherever I am because this is obviously the right place for me to be. And then people really want to work for you. And it's the same thing when you look at other industries and so on. Uh, there are certain companies who have high innovation and then practically getting people from other companies <laughs> not by needing to have headhunters to push them and say, hey, come over to this company. No, they, they, they say, I want to come and work for you. I've done this and this and this and this company, but I have so many great ideas that we could improve. And boom, you then have the products and say, wow, why didn't the others do it? Yeah, that person worked before at that other company, but they didn't let him or didn't let her. They didn't yeah. value them. Yeah, and, and that's and, and Christian, you know, you use a great example. Um, you know, headhunters, right? I mean, there mm -hmm. are so many systems. One of the things that I, I talk about, um, one of my favorite chapters is chapter ten in the book, mm -hmm. and I, I call it stepping into the BS. Yeah, and um, you know, I think most people understand BS is an acronym for um, bull poop, but I won't say the other <laughs> word. Um, yeah. But I talk about stepping into the BS because it's actually about the built systems. We as humans create systems to, you know, to help make sense out of the chaos. And I, I sit back here and when you brought up recruiters, that's a system where, you know, there's now a stage gate. It's like, it's hard to find people. So let's build the, you know, an industry of recruitment. But when you think about it, recruiters are natural humans. And so within there, they, they, we, we are attracted to those we're similar to, right? Mm. And uh, for quite some time, many recruiters looked like me. You know, they were white mm -hmm. men. And so their networks tend to be more white males. And so, you know, the, the, the selection bias, all these other things of human behavior that are almost hardwired in us start to take effect. And so that's where we have to start changing. And when I talk about taking action around do, do you do what you say you will? Sometimes it means you don't get to just keep doing what you did yesterday. You have to find new solutions. So to your point, you have to go find recruiters that access a talent pool you've never accessed before. And that means you don't get to use the recruiter maybe you use for the past 30 years. You'll have to find someone else. And I think that's the important piece. I always want to keep emphasizing using solutions to solve problems we've, you know, that we using solutions for which we've used to solve problems we faced before is great, but using them to solve problems we've never faced, we're setting ourselves up for failure. And so Except, innovation must take place. Yeah. It's like we're using the wrong screwdriver. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Ab that's that's a yeah, and that's that's the thing when you look at, especially with sustainability, um, many, many companies didn't used to have sustainability in their key focus. They they were focused on totally other stuff um, and they didn't care. And now we see that actually sustainability can be as well a profitable opportunity. Um, and it doesn't mean that you need to do stuff like greenwashing to make it profitable. It can right. be profitable by itself if you do the things with the proper focus and do it the right way and communicate as well about it and, and not only outside the organization, but as well inside so that everybody gets the message and knows as well what's expected of them and how they're supposed to do their part of it. Because just speaking about it is nice, but if they don't know what, what, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do this on this? Uh, then uh, it's much easier to to just not only have sustainability as a message, but actually do it from the from all different corners of the organization, everywhere. Everybody knows how to contribute in their niche inside the organization. And, and Christian, I love that because in particular, one of the challenges for leaders 
is part of the new capability is saying, I don't know. Um, you know, there were many times when as a former consumer marketer, I was thrust into the, you know, management of the environmental health and safety team. I had never worked in that space. And so I knew for me to be trustworthy, I needed to A, accept that and disclose it without selling myself out on the can. And it also meant I had to get up to speed. It wasn't enough for me to keep saying, oh, I've never done this before. Tough. I'm leading it now. And so I had to have the vulnerability to acknowledge my own gap, not trying to come in and be an expert because I had people with PhDs in the topics we were talking about, mm -hmm. right? And so to your point, leaders today must be able to provide the clarity without the certainty. You know, there used to be a time when corporate leaders were subject matter experts. They had grown up in the industry, you know, the, their field. But today, so much of that is changing. You know, chat GBT is, is everyone's, everyone's claiming it's going to get rid of other people's jobs, but never their own. Right. And, um, but, but I, I'm saying as technology is advancing, we're seeing new ways in which the humans involved will be freed up for other decision-making processes. And you're exactly right. You want to be fostering a culture of sustainability that every employee knows this is how I contribute. Some of our best, some of my best success stories did not come from the board or the executive team. They came from the individual working the front line of the manufacturing process that knew at the end of it, we had significant waste. And it was because when the process was designed, it was just to quickly get drug developed for early stage clinical testing. And they mm. never assumed what happens if it becomes the number one drug in the world. But because the process had been developed, no one went back and reevaluated it. And so the packaging now has 50% waste at the very end. And so yeah. we need people thinking about this. You know, I, I use it, but in early stage product development, and we need people at the front lines of current manufacturing to be able to speak up and trust themselves that if they see waste and the company says we want to minimize it, they have to speak up. They have to say, hey, we're not doing what we're saying we're going to do because of all this waste I see at the end of the production line. Exactly. And the thing is, often uh, it starts with that trust often that people as well, uh, even our education system. And yeah. we're not just talking about people who've got PhDs. When you think of it, it's people in a manufacturing environment don't necessarily have a PhD. They might not even have a bachelor, but they all, from all levels of education, they all have sometime learned in school not supposed to speak up or certain other kind of things. Some teachers are very pro, let's say, pro-innovative. And then yeah. there are the teachers where you think, this can't be. They're just one year into the teaching career and they're already misbehaving and doing everything wrong. But you think, wait a minute, if you tell kids not to speak up, what can we expect for them when they are once adults to actually speak up when it's important to speak up? Yep. And that's the thing. As you say, waste, waste can be everything. For instance, just look, let's say you look at your shipping uh, insurance and you notice, wait a minute, why is our insurance uh, fee so high? And then you go and look how the stuff is transported. You notice, hey, if you take the stuff from the ship this way, of course the stuff is going to break. Yeah. Silly. Do it this way. They do it. And suddenly your insurance costs go down because you have yeah. less waste. And it's... So simple, but most often people don't even bother going and checking these things out. They just say, oh, we have to find maybe a cheap insurance company. Yes. That's not right? a solution. <laughs> exactly. Go, go RFP and find something instead of evaluating what could be causing it. And exactly. I think that, um, that's why I love the whole concept of stepping into the BS because yeah. it's a built system. So just leave it alone. It's working. But that's where I, I often, I, I started my career as a sales rep, Christian, and I learned mm -hmm. early on the ABCs of sales is always be closing, right? Mm -hmm. And I now have accepted, you know, I was thinking, so what, if someone asked me, what, what are the ABCs of leadership? And I understand them to be, you know, always be changing. And the moment that we think something is good enough, we need to start evaluating how we can improve it. Because times are changing, technology is changing. So 
everything can be improved. And you can't always be on a constant change, but you you also can't always be complacent. And I think that's the most important thing. And then I loved what you were saying too about we are taught in school, just shut up and learn. You know, that whole kind of authoritarian, um, very much like the management style of don't ask, just do. And then the gap that happens, the reason if it's just focused on action, you, you, you aren't balanced with the can, care, do. You're, you're over-indexing on do. You don't have the employee's best interest at heart. You aren't engaging and thinking about, are we fulfilling our mission to society? We're, we're taking for production or you know, we're emitting during production, but what, what's the impact that positively we're having? And so you, you know, can, care, do must be balanced. All three must be present for us mm-hmm. to be effectively doing what we're trying to do. And that is build sustainable organizations and systems that allow both humanity and planet to thrive. Exactly. And, and that's the thing when you look at uh, just go on social media and, and just uh, listen, or let's say, look at what people are talking about, writing about when it comes to all this topic, sustainability, not just ESG, but many, many other things, electric cars, ABZ, everything, everything there. Then you actually notice that there's a lot of misconception um, with people because they're getting fed all sorts of narratives, all sorts of things where people are trying to sell stuff and other kind of stuff. And then people get the wrong ideas and they start thinking, so it must be this and this. And then stop actually doing what they were doing themselves before. Uh, like simple things, even just separating, let's say, their garbage. Yes. Don't putting paper into the garbage, putting taking it to the paper collection. Yeah, and, and that's the crazy thing that even this kind of basic stuff, that's not a new thing from the 90s. That already existed even before the 1940s. Yes. That's the crazy thing of it that uh, we now more or less have to re-educate people in all different countries and all different levels to be more sustainable and not only at home with the garbage, but as well the way they do business, the way we buy, how we consume stuff or, or even how we handle stuff. And that's the key thing and how we even educate our kids and our future employees who then eventually need to understand how we are supposed to do this and why <laughs> this is important because otherwise we will not get where we want to get to in the future. Agreed. I think it's why it's so important. I, I, I try very hard to not say ESG. <clears throat> um, in, in particularly here in the United States, right? It's become a, um, a lightning rod for debate. Yeah. Yeah. And yet when I come back and say, isn't it sad the amount of tornadoes coming through these communities or the mm-hmm. flooding or the hurricanes, you know, here in the U.S.? Yeah. When I talk about that, instead of talking about global heating, people are like, yeah, this erratic weather is really odd. You know, we yeah. it's, science says that's human generated. So that's why I drive an electric vehicle. It's why I separate. Yeah. Garbage. I try to get Me very too. specific yeah. on activities and actions. And, and I find that that's why I want, you know, especially companies to be laser focused. What is the purpose of your business in society? And if you do that, then that should be your goal for your ESG campaign, going back into the ling- lingo of sustainability. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, for me at my current company, we are health. So SDG3 is really all we talk about. And then... For investors and employees and stakeholders, you better believe we're addressing as many of the others as we can. But our company exists for uh, health and well-being, SDG3. And that's where I think companies have to start. We have to start dividing up and conquering in a way, right? Um, Exactly. And and addressing those so that we each can lead where we are most capable to lead. Yeah, and that's the true thing as well, especially about ESG itself, that it's so often so science-led. And I don't mean by the, the people who are producing with science some kind of products or medicines or other kind of items or rockets or other kind of stuff. I'm talking about the scientists who are just in the science of just, let's say, creating uh, rules and ideas that actually do not end in something positive, just something for them 
positive yes. to do. Uh, it's it's sort of bureaucratic ESG instead of being sustainable. It's actually not it being sustainable because it's wasting paper. <laughs> we are not supposed well, to waste so much. But that's why we drive. I drive as well electric car. Yeah. And now I know in the eighties there was such a big deal, especially here in Europe and Germany as well. The the forest were dying. You could drive along the motorway and you really saw sticks. Toothpicks, two big sticks that were two meters or eight feet high or whatever. It was just a toothpick. And now you can drive through, but it didn't happen through electric cars. Electric cars are now coming in. In reality, I think it's it's just a change in the way we have it. We do things and so on and how we use products, how we deliver products, whether it's health related or that kind of things. Yeah, and, and, more... and being intentional with reforestation and protecting the trees, yeah. right? Yeah. And But, you know, Christian, I loved what you were talking about with over-indexing on the science. Um, a, a, a dear friend, Allison Taylor, always says, you don't need data to mm. do the right thing. <laughs> you know, um, it, it's not hard to figure that out sometimes, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, you need it, humans. You need humans yeah. who, uh, let's say, to a certain level, uh, allow to have creativity. Because that's yeah. the thing. Uh, Always, whatever field you're working, whether it's medicine or automotive or other kind of stuff, you always need creativity to solve a problem that you've never seen before. Because certain problems, you just can't take a book and read it and say, oh, yeah. I have to do this A, B, Z or uh, X, Y, Z. It yeah. doesn't work. You have to do it and you have to find a solution. And that's so important as well for kids as well in school to actually be allowed to be creative, have fantasy. If you kill the fantasy, we we then just need ChatGPT just to tell us the garbage that we've already written in the last decade somewhere in the internet. Absolutely. Because that's no creativity and you can really notice it. And and that's the thing. You, you can't even take, I'm sure you can't go and take ChatGPT and now let ChatGPT uh, do for us medicine. Um, it might work, but I don't know if we are all afterwards dead <laughs> because well, and, we, we intoxicated I, I, ourselves. <laughs> no, and, and Christian, though, the interesting thing about that is some of the most innovative medicines were not being designed for the use today. Exactly. Right? Um, you know, they, they, they were looking at, you know, we want to treat this disease and they saw it as a side effect that yeah. this was happening. Well, actually, that this product meets another need we weren't even exploring. That's yeah, how many at, products come to play. Yeah. And, just and, look at yeah, penicillin. Yes. Same right? example. Yeah. Yes. And it's, but it's, it's the, that's what differentiates humans, the creativity to, I love calling that collecting dots so others yeah. can connect them. The, the, the challenge is we live in such a linear society that we try, you know, that this is one of those built systems. We keep trying to force everyone just head down, keep moving. But if you're mm. going the wrong direction, it's not beneficial to do so. And so you got to lift your head up and realize you're going the wrong direction and, and correct. And that's where, again, we've had such a rich conversation, but it's the frontline employees speaking up and saying this isn't right. And then giving them the culture that they can feel they can raise their voice and not be hurt that, you know, the company has their best interests at heart. You know, it, it's why this can care do is so simple to quickly run through at any given time. If you're mm -hmm. facing a challenge and, and either learn how to trust yourself, build trust within the, the team or better yet, start to rebuild trust in the systems we don't believe in anymore. Yeah, exactly. Because that lets people actually do it. And if you instill it in the entire organization and all management levels, till the lowest level in organization, then everybody knows that's the way it's done. And you can speak up, tell the truth, tell tell things that you've seen that might be improvable or how you think they might be improvable. And yeah, maybe many ideas come together and then you have a complete new solution that not only uh, helps the organization in sustainability issues, but as well maybe even creates more jobs, more profitability, more revenue, maybe even new markets. Yeah, that yeah. you didn't know before. But if you if you don't allow that kind of trust and, and creativity and, and speaking up and so on, then eventually one day somebody will just come up and either buy up the company or just overtake it and throw it onto the ditch. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. 
Exactly. So it was great having you here on the show and uh, chatting with you, Jim, about all these different but important topics, and especially as well how we can get trust into organizations. Um, I think uh, you want to share with us as well, I think, as well, how we can connect as well with you if you want to ask. And, and as well, where can we find the book as well? When is it, is it published or is it going to be published? So the, the book will be coming out in April, April mm -hmm. 10th. I'll be launching Ooh. and you'll be able to order it on Amazon. Good. Um, if you want to connect with me, um, you know, please do so. I'm on LinkedIn. Mm. And um, I also will have a website, uh, www.jimmassey.co. And um, I'll, you know, you'll be able to interact with me and share your thoughts and, and help me continue to drive trust in society within companies, but most importantly, within yourself. That's the, the main goal I have. That's great. So thank you very much for being here. And I'm sure uh, we'll be seeing sometime soon opportunities to chat about other relevant topics. I would love it, Christian. I look forward to it. So after you've heard the current episode, I would like to just um, make a few remarks. So you've been listening to all the different episodes that I've been publishing, and I've been giving you quite some nice advice here and there. I've had some guests that you might have listened to and thought, hmm, that's really interesting, and I should do this, I should do that. And OK, I've made a list, but how do I do it? Now, that's the tricky thing. I went to many courses over the last, let's say, 30 years or so, whether it was an IT marketing, backlink marketing, uh, SOE, Google advertising, and so on and so on. And so many things you can learn. It's crazy, especially if you are not a marketing agency, but you have a small business, medium-sized business, or you've just bought a company. And you think, okay, I have to take it over and have to improve the marketing. I want to increase the revenue and so on. It can be quite tricky. There are different areas. So we have to, of course, at the beginning, focus on one platform where we're going to do our marketing and sales activities. So the first platform, especially if you are in B2B, which means you are selling services or products to companies, you should go and Focus on LinkedIn, not Facebook, Meta, TikTok, and so on. That's no point. Yes, there are people there who are usually working as well in companies who might be your buyers. But in this case, I would say you're wasting your energy and your resources. So best thing and the simplest thing, if you want to get started properly, is focusing on LinkedIn and building up your profile, your content, and all these things. Now. I released recently a book based on all the stuff that I've been doing myself, that I've shown as well other entrepreneurs how to get it done. Because the thing is, you can spend so much money on people telling you, you have to do this and you have to do that, selling you courses, selling you uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. I once had a marketing agency. They sold me a service where the Artificial intelligence was supposed to get me more leads than I was getting now already on, on Google Ads. And it was supposed to cost me less. The end result was I didn't get a single lead. Of course, then I didn't make any sales, but the cost actually increased. And I compared it with my campaign that I was running at the same time for a different uh, region. And I was doing fine. Eventually, I had to kill that contract and do it myself as well for that region. And my numbers were then suddenly totally different. So that's interesting when you think of that. Sometimes people are selling you stuff that's just for the advantage of them. There are plenty of great marketing agencies out there who can do a really good service for you. And I've used some of them. And they're great people to work with and deliver value and as well a great revenue. Some of them I would even say when they touch something, it becomes gold. But even they have the limitation 
and if they cross the limitation border, there's no revenue return. Or let's say no return of investment. And that's how I think. Nevertheless, this book, it's called Social Marketing. Reaching your audience so they can buy from you with trust. Trust is very important in the buyer situation. And, and whether you sell online, on the phone, um, whether you're selling in person somewhere, you're on a stage or you're selling, uh, you've met people and then you're selling them through Zoom or Teams or whatever kind of platform, it doesn't matter. If you do not have their trust, it doesn't matter what you're selling, whether you're selling boots, stickers, um, models, aircraft, computer servers, phone systems, insurance policies, it doesn't matter. You are not going to generate enough revenue to survive. So this book, uh, you can get it on Amazon worldwide as paperback, ebook, of course, and hardcover. You can get it in the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, all over Europe, even Australia, even printed in Australia, which is awesome thing. And uh, let me tell you just the ISBN. I'm going to put it as well in the comments because some of you might get it wrong. Last time I, I did as well number the wrong number. So the ISBN code for the edition 2022, because I keep updating it every year, it's 9798 9907. Social marketing, reaching your audience so they can buy from you with trust. Simple to identify, black cover at the front at the top, you see a social media icons. And um, yeah, there's a variety of other extra material I created as well. I have added as well as an add on that you can get as well from Amazon a social media planner makes it easier to, to be a bit consistent because if you start doing these things and you don't have the space to have like whiteboards and all the things, you lose track. It's normal. You can't otherwise avoid it. So the planner is nice and easy. It's a letter format, A4 format, demanding where you order it. And then you can nicely fill it out. This is well a smaller version as well, a pocket version, which I like as well because you can always take it with you. And if you're traveling, you can you always find space. Now, this book is, is actually quite heavy. Um, and that explains as well, step by step, how to do the things, not only what you have to do, but how and why. That's so important. People keep telling them, hey, you have to do this and you have to do that. And, and then they show you flashy stuff and they don't actually explain, explain why. Now, this book has 252 pages. Crazy crazy when I think of it, how much stuff. And it's really filled. There are no white pages. At least I don't see any here. And yeah, lots of screenshots, pictures, and I've as well marked where you have to click on things, make it much, much easier for you. I firmly advise you, if you want to do these things sincerely and properly for yourself, get yourself the paperback because what I usually like, I, I take these um, sticker markers you know, these stickers that are different colors, and then I stick them in the books. I'm reading at the moment a book about cybersecurity, and there I mark as well different pages like that, and it's for me easy as well to find things. And on these stickers, you can write as well some codes and so on. Makes it a bit easier to keep track. And the paperback is printed in grayscale. The, the hardcover is color. So if you want to have color and see the pictures in color, then Spend a few dollars more and you'll get the, the color version. Um, of course, you can go and get the paperback and then afterwards uh, the ebook. If you want to see exactly how the stuff looks in, in color, the ebook is well an alternative. But um, I would take foremost the, the paper version, just easier as well to make marks in it. And you can remark or put a paper in and helps you to keep focused. So use that. It should make things much easier for you because um, the book really shows you how to do the things, why, what to look out, which mistakes to avoid, and then you can do it all by yourself. And yeah, I'm applying all these things in the book as well. 
I'm showing as well some advanced thing because at a certain point you change your strategy, but that's all shown in the book. <clears throat> and just do it. Simple. When you think of it, it's it's crazy. I think the book costs I think it's twenty dollars or nineteen dollars, twenty-five dollars. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um the paperback, the hardcover is more expensive, of course, different print. But uh, yeah, so enjoy it. Get it on Amazon online. You can get it otherwise. Um, Barnes & Noble has it as well in the US. I think Waterstones in the UK has it and some other um, retail. Otherwise, with the ISBN codes, you can as well go to a local bookshop and um, order it to them when you have the ISBN. But the easiest thing, go on Google or look as well on my profile website. I've got meetchrisbarch.com. There you will find as well all the other books. And I'm adding some more books step and some little guides that I use as well for myself. Time planner and things. Makes life easier. You don't have to reinvent everything. But I like adjusting them so that it fits more to the way I do it. And it's I think more convenient fits. So just go and get the book and yeah, work through it. Put marks and get yourself for a good start. And even if you've already started your business, increase the level how you look at and how you let others perceive you. You will notice it increases you, your outgoing way and saves you a lot of pain, tire kickers and all the other things that you dislike in those platforms means if you approach it professionally in all kind of matters, you have less of those issues, but you have to keep to it. Simply follow the guides and the tips and so on in the book. It's 252 pages. You can't go wrong. It's a lot of text. It took me a long time to write, but yeah, um, I have some friends in, in Toronto as well who are using it and uh, in UK, South Africa and so on. They're all applying it and, and quite happy because they just need the book. And if they have some questions, of course, you can ask me. But I think the book answers it pretty well. Yeah, you could do it all by yourself. So see you or hear you soon and have a great day. I hope you enjoyed today's edition of The Growth Zone Show with Christian Bartsch. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review or rating here on iTunes or on podchaser.com. If you found the content helpful, then share it on social media, please. I would like to invite you to follow our show so that you don't miss the upcoming interviews with leaders in the market. Simply visit the website meetchrisbarch.com. I will be adding the link into the description of this episode so that you just need to click on that link. On my website, you will also find the links to free templates. If you're looking for the books I have published on marketing, innovative technology, and sustainable business strategies, just simply click on publication to find my book list. The world is constantly changing in response to trends and events. As a business leader, you need to bypass the sandbanks that can hurt your performance. For those of you who are signing up to follow the show, I have reserved a few copies of my ultimate guide on content marketing and an ESG compliant cheat sheet. This is the strategy that got me top corporate clients like McDonald's, Linde, Hewlett Packard, Deutsche Bank, Volvo and many others. That strategy has been working for over 10 years and also got me contacts with police, transport authorities, military and several universities and even leading research institutes. For sure, it also worked wonders as it got me many small, medium-sized enterprises and international clients around the world. 
the link to sign up to our free broadcasting service and the guide is at meetchrisbarch.com. That will give you access to the most recent versions of my ultimate guide on content marketing. You can follow me on Twitter by using the Twitter handle capbarch. It's spelled C A P B A R T S C H. Yes, that is C A P Barch, or spelled Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. 